Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Applying the CFR to Your Curriculum. I'm Claire Harrison and this is Graham Seed. Our aims for the webinar are to answer these two questions. What is the CFR and its recently launched companion volume? And how can the CFR inform curriculum evaluation and development? I think it's fair to say that all learners want to enjoy their learning. And part of that enjoyment will probably come from feeling a sense of progress, feeling they're getting better, that things are becoming easier. They'd like some reward for their efforts. So how do you get that sense of progress? Well, you can't really track progress unless you have a plan to track it against. You need an idea from the start of what you're aiming for, of the steps to take to get you there. And you need to check how you're doing along the way and how you've done at the end. By regularly reviewing where you've been, you can see the progress that you're making. It's like planning for a journey. Select the destination, plan the route, check the map now and then to make sure you're on track, and adjust the route if necessary. Of course, it's easy with a journey to know at the end whether you've reached your destination or not. The fundamental knowledge and skills you select to build this route plan for learning can be called your curriculum. What does curriculum mean? With origins in Greek and Roman chariot racing, curriculum originally meant a racetrack. The word moved into use in an educational context in the 16th century to refer to a course of study. Today, the word often means different things to different people. I use it here mostly to refer to the knowledge and skills that you select as important for your learners, rather than to the actual learning materials themselves. Good practice for planning a curriculum tends to follow roughly this procedure. It begins with working out what learners need. To take some obvious examples, there's no point in planning to spend a lot of time on writing if your learners need English to talk on the phone. There's no point in focusing on advanced grammar if your learners are only at a basic level. And there may be no point in teaching particular vocabulary if your learners have no personal experience or need of this in their day-to-day -day lives. In other words, you need to consider your learners' context. What your learners are expecting or are expected by someone else, an employer, a parent, a ministry of education, to be able to do with the language as a result of their course of study, as well as what they already know and have experience of. Next, you use what you've found from this analysis of learner needs to inform the goals for your course and to formulate descriptions of what you expect learners to be able to do by the end of it. In other words, to define your learning objectives. When you've defined your learning objectives, you can begin to think about how you will check learning as you go along. Bearing in mind what learners want to be able to do with the language by the end of the course, what kind of assessments would make sense? If the main goal is spoken communication, for example, the best way to assess this is unlikely to be solely via a written test. Lastly, you can start to think about what activities and materials the learners will need in order to achieve the objectives you've set, and in what order and at what pace it is sensible to cover them. This all makes sense, but real life isn't always like that and the procedure might need adapting. Many learners have no obvious purpose for learning English, except that they have to. So although you can find out what they can and can't do with the language, you can't determine exactly which areas would be most useful for them to cover, because they don't know yet and many teachers have little control over the curriculum or the materials they use anyway. Often a prescribed course book is the curriculum, or there is a compulsory national or state curriculum to follow, or an important examination restricts the choice of what to cover in the time available. 
So the basic content is, to a certain extent, or even completely, often selected by someone else. What about you? Do you have to follow a prescribed curriculum? In other words, are there certain things that your school or your government says you must teach? Or do you have some choice or a free choice of what area of language to focus on? And do your learners have a clear practical idea of what they want to do with English? Or are they learning it because they have to or because they want to pass an exam or they think it will be useful for some unspecified purpose in the future? Write your answers in the chat box to the right of your screen if you want to, so we can see what it's like for you. Well, while we're waiting for people <laughs> to do that, can I ask you, Graham? Okay. Have you ever had yes. to follow a curriculum and do your did your learners have a, a ah. choice of what they did? <clears throat> okay, yes, I think um, uh, I've experienced both. So I've experienced the, the times when I had classes that were preparing for an exam and we had pretty much a set curriculum that we had to follow. Uh, but then other classes where it was a lot freer. Um, I was director of studies of a school and therefore I could, to a certain extent, create the curriculum I wanted uh, based on the, the resources we had available and what I thought the needs of my particular learners were at that time. Okay. So, yeah. It's so, been a bit of a mixture. A bit of a mixture, actually. I'm yeah. seeing a bit of a yeah. mixture in people's replies. I, I'm seeing a lot of prescribed curriculum, actually, mm -hmm. following a curriculum. And then some people saying that, that they're free to choose, which is very interesting. Lots of comments there. We'll be able to have a look at this afterwards, yes, won't we? Yeah. And see what people say and <laughs> take a bit more time on it. Okay, I'll move on now. Um, so planning curriculum learning objectives starting from specific future learner needs is not always entirely practical in reality as we saw where people said they had curricula to follow. Although it's still valuable to take this approach, albeit with some degree of flexibility. And one final point about reality. The curriculum planning procedure I described before, where you diagnose learner needs and develop learning objectives to meet them, gives the impression that teachers have a lot of time for planning, which I don't think I've ever heard a teacher say is the case. <laughs> Luckily, the CFR defines one of its purposes as being able to help with curriculum and course development. The companion volume says, fundamentally, the CFR is a tool to assist the planning of curricular courses and examinations by working backwards from what the users or learners need to be able to do with the language. Now I'm going to hand over to Graham to talk to you in more detail about the CFR. Thanks, Claire. Okay. So before I begin to talk about the CFR, I want to ask you, uh, how much do you know about the CFR already? Um, and so uh, we're going to do a poll now to check uh, how much you know. I want you to be honest, it doesn't matter. And I would like you to choose out of these four options here on the screen. So if you feel you don't know anything about the CFR, you don't know what it is, you haven't heard about it before, or maybe you've heard about it but you really don't know much about it, then choose the first option. If you would say, you know a little bit, but you wouldn't be confident enough to tell someone else about the main points in the CFR, then choose the second option. If you think you do know enough, you would know enough to be able to tell someone else about the main points in the CFR, then choose the third option. Or if you think that you do know quite a lot about the CFR already, then choose the fourth option. So thank you for choosing your four options now. We can see the results coming in of, of what you are deciding. Um, how much would you say you know about the CFR now? That you've Ooh, <laughs> hopefully enough to tell someone else about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't I know everything for sure. Every time I look in it, there's something different in it that that's I haven't true. looked at before. That's true, that's true. There's a lot in there. Yeah. Um, okay, well thank you everybody for making your decisions. Most of you are going for those middle two categories there. So uh, we've got about 40% of you saying that uh, you would know enough to tell somebody else about it and 36% uh, of you saying you know a little bit about it. So really the whole spectrum 
uh, there. So it was good to ask you about that, uh, just to get you thinking about what you know about the CFR already. Now the CFR, I'm sure you know, is the Common European Framework of References for Languages. And it's been a, a project that's been worked on by the Council of Europe in collaboration with other organisations such as Cambridge Assessment English over the last 30 years or so. And one of the first landmarks was the publication of the 2001 volume, this blue book here. Uh, and then last year, in 2018, a companion volume was released. This is a really, really useful document, and I'm going to talk a lot about it today. The 2018 document underlines, expands and develops that 2001 document. It doesn't replace it, but it goes alongside it, and it's got a lot more detail in. Um, and you can find this document available on the Council of Europe's website. It's free of charge to download. The link's here, and we'll also put it on the screen again a bit later. Now, what is the CFR? This is how us uh, in Cambridge Assessment English define the CFR. And I've highlighted some parts in red which I think are quite useful for us to see. The CFR is an international standard for describing language ability. Um, and so that means you can talk about your learners, what level they are on this ability spectrum. It makes it easy, therefore, to see the level of your learners, but also the level of uh, a course book, for example, of exams, or different stages within a curriculum. And it makes it easy to compare that, so we can have a, a common language to talk about language ability. Now, Cambridge Assessment English, we map or align our exams to the CFR levels as well. So you can see the CFR levels down there on the left-hand side. Uh, they go from A1 at the bottom all the way up to C2 at the top, meaning the most proficient learner. And we have different exams at different levels uh, of the CFR as well. Now I guess one thing you might know about the CFR, if you only know a little bit, is those levels. The six levels going up A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, and C2. Now, the authors of the CFR, the companion volume, talk about language ability like a rainbow. In a rainbow, you see a number of different colours. It's a spectrum of colour. But in order to simplify uh, colour, they simplify it into these six or seven bands of colour that we're very familiar with. And if I say, what colours are there in a rainbow, you would name those six or seven colours. But of course, actually, in reality, a rainbow is a spectrum of colour. And they compare that to language ability. Language ability, of course, is a spectrum. You don't go from one step and then hop up to the next step. It is a continuum. But in order to simplify that continuum, in order to talk about your language ability in an easier way, we use the CFR levels. And that's why it's divided into those six or seven different levels. Now, what you might not know about the CFR is that there's an underlying thinking behind everything. And they see the learner as being a social agent. And they talk about something called an action-oriented approach. And what that means is they see language is to be used for communication, for communicative purposes, and that it's to be used in real life tasks. You're learning a language to use it. It shouldn't be limited to just a classroom. It shouldn't be limited to exercises where you're just translating or doing gap fills. There's a real reason to learning, and that is to communicate. And that's one of the key points about the CFR. Now, the CFR, you might know, is made up of a number of different descriptors, illustrative descriptors, which try to describe what a learner can do at those different levels that I was talking about. 
And those descriptors are categorized into a number of different scales. And so the one on the screen at the moment is about written production, overall written production. What can a learner do, not what can't they do, but what can a learner do at different levels? And you've got some different descriptors there about what they can do. Now, it might be a bit small and you can't see it on screen at the moment, but do go back into the actual CFR document to have a look at this scale and lots of other scales with lots of other descriptors trying to talk about what a learner can do at those different levels from A1 uh, at the least proficient to C2 at the most proficient. Now those descriptors are categorized in a number of different ways. Uh, they're categorized into the language activities and strategies and we'll talk about that uh, in a minute. And they're categorized into language competences. Um, and these are things like linguistic competences, such as vocabulary, grammar, phonology, which vary quite considerably from language to language, sociolinguistic competences, and pragmatic competences. But I particularly like to talk about the language activities and strategies that the CFR uses. And that's because they're often put into these four skills. Now, traditionally, I'm sure you are aware of listening, reading, writing and speaking. And it's how we talk about learning and assessing languages nowadays in a communicative way. But the companion volume has gone a step further. And while it recognises the usefulness of talking about the skills like this, it also sees that actually in real life, we integrate those skills, we mix up those skills often. And so it talks about four modes of communication. The first of these is reception. So for example, what you are doing now, you are just listening to me talk, or you might be reading a document. The next one is production, that re requires a bit more effort perhaps, that you are speaking or that you are writing something. But communication isn't just neatly divided into reception and productive skills. It goes on and we talk about interaction. So when I'm having a conversation with Claire before we started this webinar, uh, she was talking, I was listening to her and then talking, replying, responding to what she was saying. So we are interacting. We're using two skills there, both listening and speaking at the same time. And of course, we might interact between other skills as well, between reading into writing or listening into writing or a number of different combinations. Now, going one step further on from that is something called mediation. What is mediation? The CFR, the companion volume, describes mediation as this. So the, the language user or the language learner who acts as a social agent, that, that phrase social agent again, who creates bridges and helps to construct or convey meaning, sometimes within the same language and sometimes from one language to another. So to give you some examples of what I mean by this, Mediation, mediation skills may be needed to help between languages. So, for example, if somebody knows English and somebody knows Spanish, but they don't know each other's language, then often you in the middle, you know a bit of both languages and you can try to mediate between these two people using a bit of English and a bit of Spanish. It doesn't have to be formal interpretation skills. You're doing that informally and you're using communicative language there. And you need to process that information, use lots of skills, listening and speaking, and use different languages as well. It may be between varieties of language, which could be dialects, or it could be registers as well. Think about how you change your language between a formal register into an informal register. Mediation skills can also be used between input and output. So for example, in a university lecture, I'm listening to a presenter talking, I'm writing down notes, 
And those notes later will be used for me or possibly somebody else to then write an essay. So what I'm doing, I'm mediating between the initial presenter and that final essay that I have to do. A mediation also can be used to facilitate communication generally. We often think about it if somebody's had a, a disagreement with another person, then a third person steps in and says, OK, come on, what's your point of view? And, and what's your point of view? And, and can I get you to talk together? That's a, a sort of traditional view of mediation, but it's very important in language as well. So I encourage you as teachers to think about what are the mediation skills that our learners need to learn in real life language and how can we teach that? Can we use the CFR to help us understand that? Now there are some other uh, descriptors and scales that have uh, been developed between 2001 and 2018. Back in 2001, there wasn't so much online language, and now we have two new sets of descriptors talking about the language that we use online. Online conversation and discussion, kind of like what you're doing in the chat box now, uh, and goal-oriented online transactions and collaboration, filling in those forms, etc. It's all language, it's real language that we use online now. The companion volume has a new level, the pre-A1 level, uh, which is halfway between beginning language and A1 level. And in this level, learners rely on a limited number of words and formulaic expressions. And this level is really useful because it just provides a starting point on that language learning ladder in the CFR. And it's good as a means of measuring progress that Claire mentioned right at the beginning, especially for younger learners or anybody who's just started learning English or whichever language. Now, the higher levels, the C levels, the C1 and the C2 levels have been expanded greatly as well in the companion volume. Now, the point of the C levels is that it's not meant to imply trying to get to a native speaker-like level. But it's trying to uh, define what a really proficient language user can do. Talking about the degrees, degrees of precision, appropriateness and ease of language that those language users have. It's particularly relevant for higher education or academic purposes. And so if you have learners uh, who are aiming to get into university, then look at the descriptors in those C levels to see what they might be trying to achieve. So just to conclude my little section here, let's recap some of the ways in which the CFR is shaping learning, teaching and assessment of languages. Previously, traditionally, there's been a focus on the structure of language, that you must learn the grammar in order to be able to, to do anything in the language. While learning grammar is essential and very useful, of course, that's not the point of learning a language. The focus that the CFR has is on the communicative use of the language, what's necessary to actually communicate. Previously, language was seen as a code which you needed to crack, you needed to work out in order to be able to use it. But language isn't a code really. Language is meant for action and collaboration and being very real. Think about the real life uses of a language. Language was previously just a school subject that you had to learn and then that's it. Again, Learning languages at school is very useful, but the CFR also sees how it's useful to learn languages across your whole life. In the last few years, in the last few decades, the CFR has been used in assessment, such as uh, in, in our work here. But the authors of the companion volume really want to stress that it's, it's to be used for learning, teaching, as well as assessment. So in that order. And that's why we think it's particularly important to use the CFR when you're developing a curriculum. 
Now, we want to get rid of this ideal that the native speaker uh, is your aim, is your target. The aim should be on being a, a really proficient speaker. That's where you want to get to. It may be that you will never be a, a native speaker, but the focus is, particularly on those higher C levels, to be a proficient speaker. As I mentioned, traditionally language was thinking about your receptive skills or your productive skills. And the companion volume expands that now to talking about how language is co-constructed through interacting with different people across different skills. And therefore, while the four skills of communication are really useful, perhaps even more useful is to think of language in terms of those four modes of communication that I talked about. Reception, production, interaction and mediation. So that's a bit about the CFR, but how can the CFR help you when you're thinking about designing a curriculum? I'm going to pass back to Claire. Okay, thank you very much. So, now you've heard more about the CFR, how can it help in reality? Whatever curriculum or materials you have, expectations will almost certainly be that learners will be better able to communicate in English after their course. A curriculum, in some contexts, may consist of a list of language points or vocabulary to be covered, and the materials may include a lot of written exercises. But the main purpose of learning a language is almost always communication, very often spoken. So some curricula are very much at odds with this purpose. The CFR, as Graham said, sees language as a vehicle for communication, rather than a subject to study. So you can look at the CFR alongside an existing curriculum or as you plan a new curriculum from scratch and use it to think about and maximise authentic communication opportunities in a course. For example, this is a descriptor from the speaking conversation scale at A2 can make and respond to invitations, suggestions and apologies the same content area could have been framed as a list of language points – could, would, can, can't – but instead the CFR describes what users do with the language in speech. Framing learning objectives in this way makes it more likely that spoken practice will actually happen in the classroom. Otherwise, how can learners achieve the learning objective? It will not be sufficient with a learning objective worded like this to teach the key language and practice it by completing a gap fill, as would be the case if the learning objective were a grammar point. It will be necessary for learners to actually make and respond to spoken invitations before the learning objective can be considered achieved. And giving learners communication practice that mirrors real life makes it more likely that they will improve their communication skills overall by the end of the course. This first example may be rather obvious, but looking at the CFR can also give inspiration for potentially less commonly used communicative activities. Here we have an example from mediation. Processing text in speech at A2 can report the main points made in simple TV or radio news items, and so on which suggests an information gap activity where one half of the class listens to or reads one news item and the other half has a different one and then they come together in pairs to share what they've heard or read. This integrates receptive and productive skills and mirrors real life communication where one person has information the other does not, as well as giving an opportunity to practice using past forms communicatively. It's not just spoken communication. Here we have a thread of descriptors about writing a post for a website from the new online conversation and discussion scale that Graham mentioned. So you can see, for example, at the top, B1 Plus can post online accounts of social events, experience and activities and so on. I won't read all of them to you. Um, instead of just producing a piece of writing for no particular communicative purpose and the teacher marking it, 
If the conditions are created for learners to actually make an online post, other learners can read it and comment on it, as would happen in real life, and the person writing has to think about their audience. Developing or extending a curriculum using this online conversation and discussion scale gives a communicative purpose for writing and may also help to bring the curriculum into the digital age where written communication most often takes place online anyway. As well as a consistent focus on real-life communication, the CFR also has an enormous range of coverage. It covers the four modes of communication, as Graham mentioned, reception, production, interaction and mediation, which subsume the traditional four skills of reading, listening, speaking and writing. So looking at the CFR descriptors can highlight where a curriculum or course book may favour one mode or skill and neglect another. The CFR also covers a variety of strategies such as turn-taking, cooperating, asking for clarification, inferring, planning, compensating, all of which support and enhance communication, but may be overlooked in some curricula or materials. There are descriptors for pragmatic competence, such as coherence and cohesion, or linguistic competence, such as sound articulation or orthographic control, in other words, control of a pen, and plurilingual and pluricultural competence. There's a lot more in there than you might realise. Every time I'm looking for something in the CFR, I find another treasure trove of descriptors focusing on a useful area I haven't thought of. Whether you're building a curriculum or evaluating one, it's worth having a good look through the CFR to see if there are useful areas to include for your specific learners. Although you have to be aware of trying to cover too much and then not being able to give any of it the attention it deserves. What you choose to include should clearly link back to your learner's needs and should be fully coverable within the time available. As Graham mentioned with regard to the companion volume, the CFR has been developed over decades with a huge amount of collaboration and consultation, much more than one person or one school or one country could hope to achieve alone. On the screen, here are the phases of development that the CFR has been through. I'm not going to read all of them to you, but you can see that a lot of time and effort went into uh, people looking at the descriptors um, and evaluating them for clarity and sorting them into levels. The CFR is, of course, not perfect, but with all the work that went into it, you can be sure that a lot of effort went into the wording of the descriptors and you can see that the levels of performance were validated by language learning professionals and via statistical means. So I think you can have confidence in using the descriptors as a reference point for what to teach and what to expect from learners at different stages of their development. You can compare your curriculum and materials to descriptors at a particular CFR level to see whether the content appears to be aligned and you can supplement or amend your materials in line with your findings. You can also pick key level descriptors to assess your learners against, to diagnose their strengths and weaknesses in a particular area, or to see how ready they might be to take an external assessment at a particular CFR level. Here are three adjacent descriptors from the Speaking Sustained Monologue Describing Experience Scale. So you have A2 can describe his or her family, living conditions, educational background, present or most recent job. A1 can describe him or herself, what he, she does and where he, she lives. And pre-A1 can describe him, herself, for example, name, age, family, using simple words. Imagine you are applying the descriptors we just looked at to these transcriptions of spoken performance, which are going to put on the screen in a moment. Of course, you can't hear the learner's pronunciation or see how much effort they had to make to produce what they said, so we need a little imagination. So here's Krista. My name's Krista. I'm 10 years old. I live in Budapest, in the centre of the city. I like football and dancing. What Krista produces is limited, but she manages four short sentences about herself quite spontaneously. 
Here's Peter. I'm Peter, I'm 10. Peter's language is much more limited. He manages two short sentences. And here's Erica. My name's Erica and I'm 10 years old. I live with my family in a flat in the center of Budapest. I have a brother and sister. My brother's name is Gabor. He's 11. My sister is Ava. She's 12. I'm in the sixth grade at school. My favorite subject is maths and I love playing handball. Erica has greater range and fluency. She says a lot more and is beginning to connect ideas together. So looking back at the descriptors, who do you think matches to each one? Well, Erica is probably around A2, and Krista around A1, and Peter around pre-A1, based purely on this task. This exercise is somewhat simplified here, but you can see how it could work to build up a fuller picture of learners if you did further assessments like this across all four skills or modes. We're generally better at some aspects of language than others. We may be better at speaking than at writing or at receptive schools as compared to production. And we can create a profile for each learner of their performance across the skills. The creation of a learner profile across skills could form a final assessment to summarise a learner's performance at the end of a course. Or possibly even better, it could be used to determine next steps at the start of a course if created at the start and recreated at the end or at key stages during the course, the learner should get that sense of progress. This is what I used to be able to do and this is what I can do now. And the learner might get this feeling, the feeling we said we should be able to achieve by helping learners to really see their progress. That is the end of our presentation. We hope you've enjoyed it and feel you've learned something about the content of the new companion volume and how you could use it in practice to create, evaluate or extend a curriculum for learning English. If you would like to ask us a question or tell us something related to this webinar, for example, how something we talked about relates to you or your context, please write it in the chat box to the right of your screen and we will try to respond to some of the questions and comments. OK, so we're going to get the computer now and uh, have a look at some of your comments. So thank you very much to everybody for uh, commenting and for writing some queries. Uh, right, we're just going to have a look here. If I scroll down. So I think there's some people agreeing with the yes. idea of can-do statements yes. yeah. being, being helpful. Yeah. Uh, here's one about grammar. Yeah. So grammar is still considered fundamental in the study of any language, though we are aware of the clash between the communicative approach and the traditional one talking about the, the situation in Italy. I really think that's a situation that lots of teachers across the world are finding themselves in, that traditional approach of really fo having to focus on grammar. Um, and I, I think that's, that's almost a, a battle, shall we say, that, that has to happen. But you can point to the CFR and to its focus on the communicative approach for um, using, uh, for looking at the skills and for paying some attention to the grammar, but not making it, it everything. Um, Claire, you mentioned earlier about how we uh, can use the the grammar in order to do a function, in order to communicate, rather than specifying the actual uh, pieces of grammar or pieces of vocabulary it's that's needed. It's almost just turning it around, really. So you're thinking about the communication. You need the grammar to underpin it. Of course you do. It, it, you can't throw it out the window. Yeah. It's needed. Um, but if you're thinking about what you're trying to do with the language as a first step, and then as the language, the language as a support, as a second step. And there's nothing wrong with doing discrete grammar practice as long as there's also an opportunity to really communicate, I think. Definitely. And I, I think if you're stuck in a system where you have to do grammar, you can turn it around and say, yes, I am teaching grammar, but you're doing it in that communicative way. 
Um, uh, I've got a question here. Do you think we should use the learners L1 in mediation activities? Um, I would say a strong yes to that. I think if you are reflecting the real life uh, realities of how you use the language, then it's right for you to consider the use of the L1 in your classroom and how you teach it. Um, I think it's essential if, if you're a, I don't know, let's say a Spanish speaker and you're learning English and you know that you're going into a workplace where you are going to be using both languages, then it's necessary to, to use both languages when you're learning English. And in fact, using your L1 can be a support to learn English. I, I disagree with people who say you have to do it all in English. There is a time and a place to use the L1. And mediation is a nice example of that. If you look at the CFR descriptors for mediation, you will see that it incorporates those different languages as part of those mediation activities. Claire briefly mentioned something called plurilingualism and plurilingual abilities in the CFR. And those are can-do descriptors about being able to use different languages at once almost. Um, and so the CFR would completely agree with using the L1 and all the linguistic resources that the learner has in their mind in order to, um, to learn English or to be able to communicate. It's a sort of whatever works, really, as well. Yeah, isn't yeah, it? yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay. Oh, I don't know where to go here. To move up. Um, okay. So, question: How can we take the CFR online? Is it available to take <gasps> as an online exam? Well, CFR isn't an exam. It's a framework. Um, and exams can be pegged to the CFR so that you know that this particular exam is at this level. Um, but the CFR itself is a framework to describe language at different stages of development. It isn't actually an exam that you can take. Yeah, definitely. Um, a question here, is it wise to group students by CFR level, i.e. all the B1 students in one group, mm. if the spectrum is so wide from the entry to the completion of each level? Okay, so you're, you're right. Mm. B1, for example, isn't, doesn't mean that all the learners are exactly at one point. There is quite a, a range within the, the B1. Um, I think it's useful to have some sort of categorization. And so therefore to put all your learners into one B1 group can be useful because it means you will be focusing on those B1 descriptors and you won't be sidetracked by um, other descriptors going up and up, up and down. And so you can focus just on that category of descriptors for those learners. But of course, all learners aren't the same. And so you have to take that into consideration. And you have to look at the descriptors below and you have to look at the descriptors above. So I think it's a useful categorization and it can be helpful, but of course it depends on your learning context and it depends on the students you have uh, and where they're trying to get to and yeah, and what level they are. And it's not always possible in the mixed ability no. world we live in, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and mixed ability classes are, are you know, not rare. Um, it's likely that people will have different abilities and each learner will have different abilities and different skills as well. Mm. Um, right, what else have we got? Okay, uh, can CLIL and the CFR represent a powerful means to create successful learners? Um, again, I think, do you want to have a look to yeah. see if there's some questions you'd like to answer? Um, I think, Clil, uh, so uh, that's where you are teaching a subject such as science or geography, but you're, you're teaching it in English, for example. I, I think that approach to learning is really good because you're obviously getting the content and you're getting the language side of it uh, without having a specific English class to learn English. Um, now, again, having a specific English class can be very useful. But if you are learning science in English, then you are getting those language skills, um, pardon the pun, by osmosis. <laughs> and you are learning English and science at the same time. And I really think it's a, a powerful thing to do. 
And you can then be thinking about the language that you are teaching, looking at the CFR uh, descriptors in the CFR levels to help you think about what language you can use in order to teach science. And you will have to grade your language. You will have to think about the language that your learners can cope with in order to explain those things about science. So I think CLEAL is a really powerful way of learning language and therefore the content knowledge. And I think that reflects real life as well because when they become scientists, then they will be using English uh, in their science work, for example. Yes, well, I've got a few up here that I think we can both uh, probably okay. answer between us. Okay. So there's a good question here about how do you think the modes will be assessed in mm -hmm. the Cambridge English exams? <coughs> Yeah. where they're overlapping in, in, in different ways, aren't they? For, for example, doing listening and reading at the same time and interaction yeah. and so forth is overlapping, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, at the moment, as you know, our examinations are divided into the four skills with some use of English attached to them. And the reason for that is because it's easier to try and focus on one skill at a time and assess it in a way that you feel is fair. However, it's a very good point for exams of the future um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, currently at Cambridge we are still dividing exams into our four skills because that's what people understand. People understand those four skills, whereas at the moment, I would say, in the world, there's not as much understanding of what is interaction, what is mediation. Yeah. But uh, we have built in interaction tasks and mediation tasks into our tests as well. Uh, even though, as Claire said, we have still we are still categorising them into skills, and behind the scenes we are we are looking into those four modes of communication, and and can we put them more into our test? So you're right; it's certainly a thing for the future. In fact, it's in development at the moment potentially. So we'll see how those developments go. Okay. There's a question about how the bands of IELTS correspond ah, to CFR. Okay. That's in the diagram you showed, is it? That is in the diagram. Um, so we'll send out the, the slides later. Uh, but on the Cambridge English website and on the IELTS website as well, I think you can see the IELTS bands and how they correspond to the CFR. Uh, there was a, a validation study that was carried out. You can find information about that if you if you are interested in that on the website, uh, which talks about how that uh, alignment process took place in order to work out how those IELTS band scores match up with the CFR levels. Okay, that was a good one. Um, some more examples mm -hmm. of input and output exercises for mediation. I think a lot of the time about um, summarising and paraphrasing either what you hear or what you read as a good example of mediation because you're transferring information that you pick up in one way in another way onto somebody else or in another format. Is that a good example, would you say? Definitely. I mean, there are lots of examples you can do. I like the one where you, uh, you watch a, a news programme about a particular issue, you read a newspaper mm. about a particular issue, and you talk to an expert or something about. So you're getting three different sources, and then you're taking that information, you're processing it, you're summarising it, and you have to write a, a report about that activity. So that's taking in listening and reading and speaking and listening into yes. writing. <laughs> and it's really practical. I mean, you're doing that sort of thing all the time, aren't yeah. you? Transferring things yeah. in your head and, in, and putting it in different places. Life, yeah, it? yeah. yeah. Definitely. This is a good question. Um, yeah. The companion volume is 235 pages long. <laughs> <It is. laughs> are there any summaries of the updated CFR that are more user friendly to, and can be displayed to students? I have a feeling there aren't, but I could be wrong. Do you know? <laughs> I don't know of any. Um, I would say um, the 2001 version has a nice table of kind of overall linguistic ability. Um, with the companion volume, you have got some diagrams in the early pages giving you an overall picture of the categorisation of it. But I think the descriptors, the scales, are really clearly laid out in the companion volume. And you can flick through and see, OK, well, these are the writing scales. Do I need this particular scale? Yes. 
no, may be useful, and you can pick out the ones uh, that's needed as well. Um, yeah. I think as well, it is a case of rolling your sleeves up and getting stuck in. It looks quite frightening. Um, it's a big thick volume if you print it out, but actually um, what you need to sort of digest and spend time with is only a page sometimes, I find, yeah. or several pages mm -hmm. that are talking about speaking, for example, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm interested what in. what you want to focus on. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. and then I feel I can get into it. Um, but it is why there are lots of corners of it that I'm still not familiar mm. with, because I dip into <laughs> it for what I need. Um, but yes, take a bite-sized approach, I think. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes, I and mean, it just shows how comprehensive uh, it, it is. OK. Uh, have we got time for one or two more? I would think I don't know so. We, um, um, there was a question. I've, I've floated past it now, but mm. there was a question about course books and mediation. Oh, OK. And people thinking, well, how can I... Or, how can, I, how can I use the four modes or how can I use mediation? Because course books are not written to reflect that. I suspect that at the moment you might find mediation in books that have a more academic slant because those are academic skills. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. I think books still reflect the four skill definition and description and division, I should say, don't they? And I think that's what, as, as with our exams, it's what people are familiar with. Um, but I think we will see that changing over time as well. I think we yeah. will. And, you know, mm. as you were talking about CLIL earlier and a, and a lot of um, different situations in which, um, in which people are learning language now, I think it's going to become necessary to start to include those kind of skills in course materials. Mm -hmm. um, OK, just... Uh, few more minutes I think we've got. Um, a question, it sounds like rather focusing on fluency rather than accuracy. It's a, a good question. Um, I see where you're coming from, definitely. The, the focus is on successful communication. That's what the focus is on, which may be fluency, but it certainly mm. needs a degree of accuracy as well. So I wouldn't argue in favour of either fluency or accuracy, both are important. The point is, what do you need in order to communicate successfully? I think you need both, but you don't need perfect levels of both in order to communicate successfully. Okay. Um, okay, should we have one final? I'm gonna take that final one there. If there's one final okay. one before we run out of time, that would be look. great. Okay, so uh, one uh, question is, how does the CFR help attention to diversity? Um, now, this is all about language. Uh, firstly, the CFR is language neutral. It isn't explicitly focused on English. It can be used by all languages. Um, and in that case, you could say it's attempting at being diverse. Um, I want to go back to those plurilingual scales that, that Claire and I mentioned earlier as one way of looking at diversity. Um, another scale is about pluricultural uh, ability. So um, with language, language is often quite tied up in culture. To what extent is it useful for learners to uh, develop that awareness of other cultures as they study languages. I think it is, and there are the scales in the CFR companion volume which look at um, those aspects. Um, and so I, I think that's a really interesting um, and, and diverse aim of the CFR. Okay. Okay. So you found one I final found one? one here at the <laughs> bottom. Um, some American teachers in Thailand say that the CFR was designed for European students. So uh -huh. they cannot be applied here in Asia. Um, what do we think about that? <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's been written, I think, thinking of European languages, right? Yeah, I think so. It was. And there are just a few points within the CFR that you can tell, mm, yeah, that's thinking about Indo-European languages. Um, but the CFR can be used globally. But I think the message to Asian teachers and students would be the same to European teachers and students, and that is, is it useful for your learners? If it's not useful for your learners, then don't use it. Um, <laughs> and so as you go through the CFR scales and descriptors, think, okay, with these, these Thai learners that I have, 
would it be useful for them to, to look at this particular scale or these particular descriptors? Can I modify the wording of the descriptors? By the way, you can, and the CFR authors want you to do that. Uh, it's okay to adapt things to your context. So uh, you're right, it may not be 100% useful, but it should be a good starting point. And uh, yeah, tweak it, change it, adapt it as much as you like. But, and hopefully this is the point of, of what we want to say today, yeah. is think about your learners, think about the context that they're in. And when you create a curriculum based on the CFR, it's got to be about the learners, hasn't it? And the CFR is the inspiration or the impetus, really, you know, helping you to plan your curriculum. But it's not a straitjacket. It's, yeah. it's not a framework that you're boxed into, yeah. um, that you've got freedom to adapt it as you wish. Yeah. Okay, okay, right. So. That's all for today then. We hope you found it useful. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, and from us, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>